I, I'm thrilled that we have Pete Gudomsky here with us today. Uh, Pete is a geospatial engineer at Development Seed living in Longmont, Colorado. Pete uh, helps maintain many libraries within the Stack ecosystem, as well as other open source projects. Um, and his research has focused on the uh, use of LIDAR to understand uh, snow and glaciers. Uh, and Pete's here to introduce us to all the good that Rust brings to Python. So thank you, Pete. Please uh, go ahead with your talk. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Max. Uh, st stoked to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to chat, chat at y'all um, about Stack, Python, and, and Rust and kind of how we're um, working with them all kind of together. So um, to set a little bit of context, just make sure we're all on the same page. So Stack is an open community specification um, for search and discovery for geospatial data. Um, it's 1.0 release was in May 2021, I believe, and it recently had a non-breaking 1.1 release uh, just earlier this year. There's really four main entities in Stack. Um, there's the catalog, the collection item, and then the API specification. A catalog's analogous to just a file system folder. A collection's like a catalog, but it contains um, date, time extents, and spatial extents. And then items map roughly onto granules um, as you would think about them. So for instance, if you have um, uh, multi multiple bands of a raster in multiple files, those would all be assets under the same item. Um, assets are the things that point at the actual data files and assets can belong to um, both items and collections. Um, the reason why I put the assets in kind of uh, dotted lines is because they don't live on their own. They live within items or collections. I also put in here um, kind of a, a structure I'll talk about later, which is a Stack API search. Um, so Stack both has like data structures and then it has an API specification of how you interact with servers or look for things. And that search structure that you use to go query things is um, I think becoming more and more important and I'll talk about it more during this session. Um, one of the kind of the key points about Stack and what differentiates it from some other kind of like open geospatial things is it the metadata are decoupled from the assets themselves. So um, you can use Stack, um, a bunch of different stacks to point to the same pictures from space or whatever. And so um, Stack items can live within a database and then be exposed via server. They can also just live on blob storage as what's called a static catalog. And you can just use them directly like that without a server in between you and the user. And then all these items will point to some sort of geospatial asset that you then can use to do science or whatever excellent things you want to do. Um, <laughs> a lot of people talk about like where does Stack fit in the geospatial ecosystem? How do we use it? How do we use it with Czar? All these different things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this more later, but I really think that Stack works best in the like level one to level two space. So that's going to be like relatively disorganized geospatial assets. So they might be like tiles, but they're going to be like, you know, sentinel tiles or whatever that are skewed and, and put all over. They're not like gridded up into a giant perfect like data cube or something like that. And so um, in my opinion, that's where stack really shines is with like raster, raster data and point cloud data in the level one to level two space. And because it's a community spec and it was a community spec that was developed um, like with a whole bunch of input from a lot of different organizations, government agencies, et cetera, um, it doesn't have like a really coherent software architecture. There's not like one library. Um, there's a lot of stuff written in Python. There's a lot of st stuff written in JavaScript. And so here's just a listing of some of the Python libraries that are used in the Stack ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> I've kind of differentiated them here by uh, producers, developers, and data consumers. This is some terminology that's used on the Stack website, but essentially like some people create Stack metadata. Some people create servers that serve Mac stack metadata. And then a lot of people want to consume stack and then do cool things with it. And so you'll see that a lot of these libraries here near the bottom of the list are things that you might be familiar with if you've used stack to solve research problems. So that's PyStack client, which is searching APIs. And then there's ODC stack and stack stack, which are two ways of turning raster assets, especially in that level two space into these nice data cubes and x-rays that we really like working with when we're trying to like solve big modeling problems and things like that. Okay, whirlwind tour of the stack ecosystem. What kind of issues do we have with the software ecosystem? So the first thing is, is like a lot of those original libraries are pretty embedded into people's dependency stacks, right? So this is from PyStack. Um, it's in a lot of places. And so even making little changes can um, have a lot of knock-on effects. I forget what, what the lot, there's an XKCD about it, but like 
the one where like somebody will find a way to use your library in a way you would never expect. Um, that is definitely true of PyStack. And so I found every time we've changed something in PyStack, it's broken something for somebody. And so we try and move really slowly with those because we know it's embedded in a lot of places. Also, that those categorizations of the three different types of folks, providers, developers, and users, they have different needs, right? Like Pydantic's really cool in the StackFest API space or in the Fast API space when you're making servers. It might not be as useful more downstream. And so you might build different tools for different folks, even if you're using the same spec. And then we're in a space where performance can matter. It doesn't always matter. Um, let's not over-optimize, but a lot of times we have a lot of things. And so doing things efficiently and well um, can really be helpful. And that's kind of where Rust starts coming in. So <laughs> I, I put strategy in quotes here because it's not really a strategy, but like how we're trying to attack the problem is not by making the one stack library to rule them all, but by making lots of little bespoke things and then stitching them together. Um, it's pretty common. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of technologies, what we're doing with them, and then kind of show you the, the crazy yarn on the chalkboard chart of how it all stitches together later. Um, so the first thing that we're really interested in right, in right now is Stack Geo Parquet. So um, Stack is defined in terms of GeoJSON. And so JSON's really big and bloated. And so people obviously want to find ways to store it and ship it around more efficiently. You can obviously just compress things, um, but as we'll see later, if you compress things in an organized way, like into a parquet file, you, you actually can use it in other ways other than just being less bloated than a giant parquet or than a giant JSON. And so this is just a quick comparison of like a thousand Sentinel-2 stack items from somewhere. And you can see you get big wins out of compressing, but you get even bigger wins out of putting into parquet, which is kind of fun. Stack parquet is not just map a JSON into Parquet, you can do that, but there's some things you can do to make it smarter. So there's a little micro spec that um, Tom et al. Um, developed um, that's in a repo in the Stack Utils repo um, or in the organization. Um, and so we've made essentially another tool to read and write Stack Geo Parquet with the idea of trying to make it really easy and kind of like brain dead to be able to make Stack Geo Parquet files and then transform them into JSON dictionaries and back and forth again. So there's a um, Python package called StackRS. Um, feel free to check it out. And you can just write a dictionary of things, such as from a stack search, down to a parquet file, read it, and do things like that. There's also a command line interface. So if you're like me and like doing things like this, um, you can do that as well. And this is a nice way to go back and forth really quickly. So a lot of times now when I make stack examples of like a thousand items, I'll put them in a GitHub repo in GeoParquet format, and then you can always just suck it back out to JSON and take a look at it later. So um, just little handy things. And then I'm also kind of exploring how we might use GeoParquet as a part of a server. Um, this is still some science projects, um, but take a look in like March 2025 for some stuff about this. And I'll probably be talking about it at the Cloud Native Geospatial Conference as well. So um, as they say, watch this space. Um, another really cool thing about the Stack API spec is that it's built on OGC standards, including CQL2. <laughs> that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your opinions on CQL2 and OGC. But um, in general, like OGC or CQL2, excuse me, is very flexible, but there's not a lot of examples on like how to actually use it. And so that's something that we're trying to work on um, kind of generally. So we've made like a very a devoted um, CQL2 parser. So this is like a complement to PyGeoFilter, but it's more like focused. And it just literally can just take CQL2 text, convert it to JSON, convert it back again, and then convert it to SQL statements, SQL statements, to then try to do queries on the database or some sort of database-like thing. Um, so this is both a command line interface and a Python library. Right now, CQL2 uh, is supported both in PGStack, so in Postgres, and in Elasticsearch. And we are working on going to DuckDB, which is going to be really powerful, and we're pretty excited about it because everybody's excited about DuckDB. All right, DuckDB, if you're not familiar, is kind of like an in-memory database engine to query stuff. Um, it likes going to Parquet and back and forth again, which is kind of nice. And this is where the whole storing stack in GeoParquet isn't just for making it smaller, but it also makes it queryable, which is kind of neat. And so instead of searching a stack API, you can actually just search a stack GeoParquet file with the same parameters, all the same stuff using DuckDB. And um, do the same type of search you would on a, a, on a stack API. And so this is available both from a command line interface 
and from Python. A slight digression into Stack API search. Um, I think it's like going to be really useful. So I think Stack API search basically has three main things to it. It has date times, geometry, and then CQL2 for just like query everything else. So if you're looking for stuff in geospatial land, this is kind of the stuff you need. And I think that st the Stack API search structure can like be useful kind of generally whether the data you're actually querying are stack or not. And so um, all of this tooling that we're building is kind of built around this idea that the Stack API search structure is kind of like the way that we're going to ask for things and discover things, which is kind of fun. So I realize I'm coming up on 15 minutes. So here's how all those like ideas, the Stack Geo Parquet, DuckDB, CQL2 kind of get put together in a library sense. So this is going to be a little bit of just a roadmap of like what we're building and then where we're going next. And hopefully maybe it'll be useful for you. So if you remember at the beginning, I had that chart of going down and either going directly to blob storage or going through a stack API to get to assets. So I think that right now we already have going through servers to search via Postgres, via Elasticsearch, other things to find assets. I think Stack GeoPark might provide this cool short circuit where we'll be able to just ask a Stack GeoPark file in blob storage where the assets are in the space that I need. And then you can go straight to the assets without having that server in between. And so I think that might be a nice addendum to the ecosystem. I don't think it's going to replace everything. And then there's like huge scaling solutions like Ice Chunk and things like that that are going to work at the mega scale. But I think in terms of like right sizing you know, the solution that you have for your infrastructure, Sometimes you're going to want Postgres and a server in front of it, but sometimes you might just want 10,000 items in a stack geo parquet on blob storage. So I think this is a cool thing that this tooling will enable. Um, this is what the ecosystem sort of looks like. And I, I'm going to make a couple shout outs to things that I haven't mentioned yet. Um, so first is uh, OpStore um, from Kyle Barron, um, a development seed. It's basically a way to do <coughs> Uh, cloud backend agnostic reads, writes, puts, gets, that sort of thing. Um, and it's based on um, the Rust library called Object Store. This all kind of comes out of the Arrow um, ecosystem. Um, so this is kind of a neat way to write tools that work everywhere. It's not just AWS specific or whatever. Um, StackRS is the core Rust library that uses Object Store. It also uses GeoArrowRS and the CQL2RS. And then from there, we go up into Python. So we make Python bindings to the Rust, and then we have these libraries and packages. Um, we haven't done yet, but we'd like to incorporate StackRS into PyStack Client, so that way you can use PyStack Client to query Stack Geo Parquet files, which would be pretty neat. Um, and then we're also working on some Rust tooling for the PG Stack ecosystem as well. There is a giant listing of all of these things. Now, these slides will be available, uh, or they actually are available on the public internet right now. So if you want to click through and kind of read about them, that'll be there for you. Um, briefly, I haven't really touched, actually like talked about Rust very much. Um, Rust in Python is a really interesting space. Um, it can be overused, and there's some problems with it, of course. Um, I think building the wheels from Rust into Python can be a little awkward. Um, and um, so when we're writing all of these Python libraries with Rust underneath them, we might make, make people's build experience a little bit worse. And so that's something that we're like kind of constantly trying to work on and think about. Another key thing is just because you write it in Rust doesn't make it faster. Um, and so this is a bit of a abstract diagram. It's around a problem called hydration, which is um, essentially like taking the repeated data out of a JSON um, document and then putting it back into it. And basically we did some experiments and like, <clears throat> just because it's written in Rust doesn't mean it's faster. So that's just this, I put this up just as a word of caution. Like, if you just have a Rust library and you're passing all the data into the Rust library, doing stuff and then passing it back out again, that might actually be slower than just doing it in Python the entire time. We found that most of the advantages come when, in this right example, you keep things in Python land and you're actually manipulating Python objects with Rust, which is a thing you could do that's kind of fancy. And so this is just a word of caution. Like I write, I write Rust, just because it's in Rust doesn't mean it's faster. Um, so we could talk more about this. I realized I kind of blew through that. Um, yeah, okay, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour. I said a lot of words, a lot of terminology. Um, again, I think the, like zooming back slightly, I think the whole um, write lots of micro repos and stitch them together thing is like useful, but we need to make sure, like I need to make sure to keep talking about it. I think we all need to keep 
finding the bits where they work and where they don't. Um, I, I think the stack community can do a little bit better in communicating on like what we have and like wh where we're going. And so hopefully this will help with that. Um, I also think that like the interaction between stack and like the czar and the x-ray and the data cube worlds, uh, we still need to like get that story sorted out as well. And I think the like handoff between level two and level three data is where I think that that's going to be the most fruitful um, and not trying to push stack all the way all the way up to the like super analysis products that are super gridded, but really trying to work on that interoperability. And so I do think there's some space to like either improve stack stack and OTC stack or try and come up with another way of kind of bridging those those gaps between like ungridded and gridded data and things like that. So that's my soapbox. Um, yeah, and these slides um, will be available on the internet and that's all I got. Thanks for your time.